Good morning. Uh, it's Thursday morning, 1030. So it's uh, time for our COVID-19 uh, update um, for the triad region and our region and our state. So what I put out for today's topics was where we've been, where we are now and where we're going. So where we've been um, seems like forever, doesn't it? Um, in late February, um, we started to get ideas that we might see um, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 in our area. And then in March, we all started getting ready, both as communities and healthcare systems. Mid to late March, we started our shelter in place as cases started to occur. <clears throat> and then uh, particularly our larger urban areas in North Carolina became affected, Charlotte, and then um, to some extent the Triangle, less so here uh, in the Triad area. And then in some areas in North Carolina, the more rural counties, particularly mountain counties, uh, were relatively spared um, during the month of March. Now as we've gotten into April, We've seen that our shelter in place is working and in the last two weeks I've congratulated everyone because it's because of your efforts as citizens and as people uh, who live in our counties and in our families um, and people within our community that it's the sheltering in place is working. So what's, uh, what's happened in the last uh, week or so and where we are? <clears throat> well, as far as the cases go, um, Mecklenburg um, and the Triangle have had slow declines in the number of new cases per day, so things seem to be cooling off a little bit. Numbers of hospitalizations in the state have dropped um, uh, per day, um, and, and that's also a good thing. Our number of deaths, while still going up some, um, aren't going up at the rate that they were. So. For the most part, as a state, um, things are looking good. We're on, on the course to being able to start thinking about relaxation of shelter in place. Um, here in the Triad area, uh, Forsyth County, our case numbers remain low um, and our hospitalizations um, are, are the lowest they've been really um, since the, the brunt of the outbreak started around the, the 1st of April. Guilford County, um, we've had a few clusters of uh, infections occurring. Um, and what is a cluster? Well, a cluster is exactly what it sounds, is when you have groups of, uh, uh, of people and infections occur within those groups. Um, and that's not uncommon in epidemics or outbreaks because in an epidemic um, is, is nothing more than a series of, of medium-sized epidemics that come together and those medium-sized epidemics are part of small epidemics that occur. And obviously um, cases are going to occur from contact of people from one place to another. Now while a lot of people have been sheltering in place, there's been a lot of people who still have to work. These are people who are um, uh, essential uh, to things going on. So like Pick, um, pick something that might be essential, like making gasoline for our cars or uh, food distribution, um, people who drive trucks to get the products to what, where, where we need them so we can buy them, toilet paper manufacturers maybe, for instance. These are all essential people, right? And so those groups of people are still going to work, and occasionally you might get outbreaks or clusters in those areas. So. Um, we, we've anticipated that, that this would occur, and in fact, uh, there have been clusters happening all through North Carolina. But when clusters happen, you might see a, a bump in the number of cases reported for an area because of those clusters. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's widespread community transmission. Uh, it just means that we have cases occurring in clusters, and clusters are something that in public health uh, we know what to do uh, in order to contain them. So, I just thought if uh, people are are checking the uh, uh, are checking the um, the numbers from North Carolina, you might see some bumps uh, in and around Guilford County uh, because of that. The other thing that we've been learning 
um, throughout this outbreak, not only here in North Carolina, but also all across the whole entire country, that, um, that um, we need to be paying more attention and gathering data related to race and ethnicity and social economic status, because not all groups are, um, are equally affected by an epidemic where it occurs, and some groups might um, have um, more uh, risk for transmission to occur with it because of uh, social economic uh, issues or because of access to health care or access to um, uh, things that you need for, for life and living. Um, and so um, we need to be gathering that data, and here in North Carolina we're doing it now, and it's now available on the uh, North Carolina's uh, epidemiology website for COVID-19, uh, the dashboard, so to speak. Uh, and so you can see what's going on with that here in North Carolina. But it's an area where we need more work, we need more research. And we as in public health and as physicians, as communities, need to pay attention to that. Um, <clears throat> so where are we on our checklist? If you remember last week, I talked about a checklist that needs to be completed for relaxation of shelter in place. Um, and the term social distancing has been also thrown out and people um, go back and forth between shelter in place and social distancing as words. I'm going to try real hard to change the name social distancing and call it personal distancing instead. Because I've found, and a lot of people have found um, during this outbreak, that you can still say socially in touch and socially together um, and, uh, and still have personal distancing. So it's basically giving people their personal space, which we were all taught in kindergarten, right? Give, give them your personal, that's their personal space. Give it to them. So, as we start to relax our shelter in place, personal space is still going to be important, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. So the checklist, if, I, if you remember, the checklist is, one, are our case numbers coming down, and have they been down for 14 days? Second thing on the checklist, are hospitals ready? Are they ready to go? So if we relax and the number of cases increase again, uh, can we handle that? And also part of that, are the hospitals starting to get back to normal to take care and do the other things? So as people go out, they tend to get in more car accidents, um, and, or maybe they're, they're doing their jogging more and they sprain an ankle. Our healthcare is healthcare ready for that. So that's number two. Number three is, is our testing capacity at at, at, a, at a level so that as we relax and if cases are identified, can we test them? Number four, I think I'm at four, is I think um, is contact tracing in place. So if a positive test happens, do we have the ability to trace the contacts of that person from 48 hours before they got sick to, uh, to the time that their test became positive? And then lastly, are we as a community ready for real isolation and quarantine? So if you're infected, you're in isolation. If you're a contact, you're in quarantine. There are other things on the checklist as well, um, and, and these are available on the web. Um, but uh, but I, in my mind, those, those are the main things um, for an area and a community. So number one. Um, can we check off cases going down? Yes, for the most part, I think we can. I'm keeping an eye. We can keep an eye on, on some areas in the triad, uh, Guilford County maybe. Um, but uh, otherwise, here in the triad, check. Um, I, think, um, I think we're going to be OK there um, at the end of that 14 days of decline. So we're on about day eight or nine of decline right now. So we have a few more days to, to complete the 14 before we're sure. Um, now, not all areas in North Carolina are on that same curve of decline, and I'll come back to that. Um, number two for the triad, uh, are our hospitals ready? Yes, our hospitals are ready. Um, our planning is 
is done, we have surge capacity plans so that if uh, resurgence occurs after relaxation and cases start to go up again, we're ready for it. Um, do we have enough PPE? Still a little bit touch and go, but we have done a lot of modeling and have looked at our quote burn rate of PPE, which is how fast we use it, and we found um, that I think we're going to be all right. Are we starting to get ready to gear up again to start doing things that hospital and healthcare does normally? Yes, those plans are in place now so that when relaxation starts to happen and, um, and we're given a green light from um, state, local government, um, we, we will be uh, starting to, to ramp up our normal operations. This takes a little bit of time. Um, and it's actually uh, harder to do to get things back to normal than it is to stop them. Um, but those plans are going on now, both for surgery as well as for outpatient clinic visits um, and uh, also for our other educational uh, things that we do as a healthcare system, including our medical students and our house staff training. And, um, and I, can, I think I can speak for both us and as well as for Novant. Uh, and the other hospitals in the Triad region, um, yes, I think, I think we can check off that we're ready. Um, uh, how about testing? Are we ready on testing? I'm going to put a, a, a half a check in that box right now, today. Um, we are, have expanded our testing. We're starting to test more outpatients now, particularly vulnerable people, people who are older and people who are um, uh, have underlying health conditions who have illness compatible with COVID-19. So we're not testing asymptomatic people uh, except for very special groups. Um, so if you have a respiratory illness and you're ill, call your doctor. Um, if you, um, or you can still, if you want, just have your flu-like illness at home and do the seven, seven plus three rule. You don't need a test, you don't have to have one. But if you particularly um, have underlying health conditions or you're older or you for sure, have, you know, you think you've been in contact with people, um, then yeah, call your doctor and, and now we can get you tested. For here in, uh, in uh, for Wake Forest Baptist Health, you can call 336-70-COVID uh, to get in contact with the respiratory clinic that can help you do an assessment and testing if needed. Um, but you also can talk to your primary care doctor um, and, um, and they can help too and decide whether you should be tested and if so, where to go to get that. But we have more capacity now for testing. So half a check in that area. Um, we um, also are testing our healthcare workers who get sick. Fortunately, we have not had many. Um, and, um, and then we are also are testing women who are starting to be in labor. Um, because of a study done in New York City that showed that for some reason women in labor sometimes are asymptomatically colonized or have the SARS-CoV-2 virus in their respiratory tract. Um, and, um, and then during the labor process, um, for those of you who have gone through it or been a partner for somebody who went through it, you know there's large volumes of air that are oftentimes expelled in the pushing and labor process and so if a person is asymptomatically colonized this can get into the air. So if we test people um, then we don't have to use all the PPE um, to protect ourselves because we know they're negative. So um, we're, we're starting to do that now uh, in our hospital system. Um, so uh, testing a half a check. I think in a week I think we'll be at a full check there because we'll be able to expand more and our capacity will even be greater. You may have heard about an at-home test um, that can be done. Uh, this is a, a, a kit that's put together um, and, um, and put out by LabCorp, which is a large commercial testing laboratory. And then if on a doctor's order, you can get this test, have it at home, actually swab your own nose, and then you put the, that swab in a receptacle at, that's sealed and then is mailed to LabCorp. A few details on that um, yet to be worked out. I don't know what the turnaround time is going to be yet on that, 
<clears throat> and I think you have to have a doctor's order to get it. Um, but uh, initially, they're going to be distributing those test kits for at-home testing for uh, heavily affected areas, um, which is our, our large urban areas, and or uh, for healthcare workers. Um, in, um, um, so that's any additional testing that we have out there is a good thing. Um, and, and this is something that you might see rolled out. Um, I don't think they're available yet in our area in North Carolina, but coming soon. Um, what's an advantage of an at-home test is, well, it's at home, so you don't have to go somewhere to go get it done. Uh, not only is that convenient, but for some people, particularly people who have underlying diseases or who are older, um, kind of don't want to go out a lot. And, and you may not want to go to, you know, areas where there's a lot of other patients. <clears throat> Although, safe, we haven't had any issues. But a lot of people are just more comfortable being at home. Also, for public health people, if they want people tested, it's easier to do it at home than to be bringing them in because they have shortages of PPE more than hospitals do. So if somebody tests themselves at home, we don't have to put on the gown and the masks and the gloves and everything because you're at home. So, so there are some advantages to it. Maybe a disadvantage still to be worked out may not quite be as sensitive. We'll have to see as time goes on. So a half a check for testing now. I think we'll have a full check next week. Um, are we ready for contact investigation? I can't put a check in that column quite yet. Um, our public health has to ramp up in this area. The state is now, I think, contracting for people to help with contact investigations. And we're looking at ways to shore that up some. I think we're going to need a couple more weeks there. Um, and then are we ready for isolation and quarantine? Well, it's you out there. You know, um, if we go from a shelter in place to an isolation and quarantine means that if you've been identified either by symptoms without a test, or by a test, then you need to you need to be in isolation for that seven plus three at home. And if you're a contact of one of those people, you need to quarantine yourself. Um, a lot of Netflix for a while, and that's for 14 days. And and that's that's going to help. So if we don't do this all shelter in place as a community, then we're going to have to make sure that sick people and people who have been contact with sick people do the shelter in place. And I think some of this is going to be on the honor system for a while until we can get people to check on you more. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing what they did in China, sending people to quarantine centers. You know, I don't think we're going to be putting people on your doorstep. I don't think we're going to be fining you large amounts of money if you break quarantine. This is what other countries have done. I think we're going to do it on an honor system, and everyone is going to do their part and be a good citizen for that. Um, so we're not quite all yet checked off for our area. So how much more time do I think we need to shelter in place before we can start to relax? Well, what I think is not, <clears throat> it's actually what the governor thinks is what the important thing is. And then from there, local communities. I've been in contact and discussing things with our local communities here. Um, and letting them know where we're at, um, I, I think we need a couple more weeks. So we're getting closer to a time of relaxation. Um, but I think we need a couple, couple, three more weeks. We'll see what the governor says. We all want to be ready so that when we relax, we can do it in a, uh, in a controlled way. So what is relaxation going to mean? Um, it doesn't mean that, boom, everything goes back to normal. Um, COVID-19 is going to be around for a while. Um, and uh, it's going to be around, um, you know, for long enough into the next year. Um, so that if we, I don't, if we relax totally 100% for normal, yes, we will give a second wave. No ifs, ands, or buts. It will happen. So we're going to have to find a way to do things like have personal distancing, but yet be able to do some of the things that we want to do. So there are safe things, I think, and then there are some things that are probably more distant, down the road things to open up. 
So unsafe things are things where there's a lot of personal contact between people. Um, and, you know, massages, um, uh, getting a tattoo, um, you know, things like that. Um, unfortunately, that might also mean our fancy weight, let's call them grooming stations, okay? <laughs> you know, places to get our haircuts and salons and such. Um, We'll have to see how that goes. I, I, I have not gotten a haircut. I followed the vote that you guys all did. But um, I, we're either going to have to be, I, I think it, those are going to be a little bit further down the road. Now what the governor does, I'm not sure, but that would be my advice. Fitness centers, these are places where there's a lot of air going out. At least it is when I exercise. Um, so. Um, when you have a lot of air exchanges, even asymptomatic people, if they're colonized, can get it out there and then it gets on the machine and if you don't clean the machine, the next person that gets on. So a fitness center may be a little bit down the road. Gymnasiums may be so too. Um, those are probably somewhere in the middle. Um, so if you do a three-stage report, they would be in the middle. What about, um, what about small businesses? I think small businesses can be safe. It, it can be well done. Um, in, in what a, when a business is, is given the green light um, to reopen, and the green light will come from government, and uh, then um, you have a way in place. Start thinking about it now if you own a small business. What would you do? How would you do it? How would you keep people you know, with their personal distance. So uh, does it mean limiting the number of people in your place? Uh, or putting, doing like what the grocery stores have done, you know, the marks on the floor when you're standing in line and things like that. Every small business is a little different. Um, and, um, but I, I think a lot of those are probably, uh, is, is, can be done and can be done safely. Anything outside I think is fine. Um, and uh, you know, exercising outside parks, greenways, bicycling, that remains fine. Um, I think um, I think actually, my personal opinion is that playgrounds can be reopened earlier on, um, in in the relaxation because there's the sunlight kills the virus, wind blows it away, um, and maybe there should be some self policing of how many people are on that playground, but. Uh, what about spl splash parks and water parks? Well, I'm talking with the city and the county about that. Um, it, that may be, well, first of all, it's still a little chilly outside, um, and, but uh, for, for pool opening, usually we think about that around Memorial Day, so we have some time to get that figured out. Um, and um, the thing about the pool is not the water, it's not the swimming. It's the, uh, the people on the deck doing all the deck things. So is there a safe way to open a pool or a splash park? I think so, probably. It may limit the number of people going in and finding a way, you know, depending on your, on your address or such, you know, what day is your pool day or your splash park day, um, or signing up in advance, having reservations, uh, I'm, you know. I haven't worked, no, we haven't done the details yet, but yeah, I think it can be done. Uh, limiting concessions because when food and stuff is around, people congregate around that. Um, and then locker rooms, probably not such a hot idea. Um, so if you come to the pool, come in your suit and you leave in your suit. Just like, you know, a lot of the homeowner association pools and such, is, there's no locker rooms there and we're all fine with that. So we're talking about things to do that we can open up that would be safe, but there's going to be a lot of things that won't seem still normal. There's not going to be a lot of large sporting events. There won't be groups of people more than 20 to 50. We're still going to have to figure out what to do with their places of worship um, and how that might go for large congregations of people. Um, and that, that won't seem normal for a while. But yeah, I think we can start relaxing to some extent. But so when it's over, it's not over. I don't know if Yogi Berra said that or not, but uh, um, I, I, it, it, it may not be totally over for some time. And so there's some things we're just going to have to get used to doing differently. Um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. 
Well, all of uh, when when we get the green light from the governor, do we all get the green light at the same time? I don't know the answer to that. Um, it looks like as a nation, we're not getting the green light all at the same time. Some states have said, "Hey, whatever." Um, I'm not sure I agree with with what some of those states have done, but they didn't ask me. So, um, but uh, so when you have some places that are um, are kind of basically saying, you know, it doesn't matter, we're just going back to normal. But the virus doesn't know that. And, and I, 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 I can almost guarantee you those places are going to have problems again with resurgence. Um, and when those places have problems with resurgence, then we got to start thinking about travel and back and forth. Um, and um, because uh, that's how these clusters get back and forth. So. I, I think, uh, you know, would it make sense to open up Kernersville but not Clemens? I, you know, it doesn't, no, because we all go back and forth and we're commuters and we work and live in different places. So we kind of, we might have to keep an eye on Guilford County. Guilford County will have to keep an eye on us and so on and so forth. There are some places, though, that are kind of isolated by their own nature. So if you get out in the mountains, I think Madison County, for instance, I don't think they've had any cases. Um, so um, can they open up? Sure. Uh, does that mean that we're all going to be welcome to go to what Madison County and rent the house and hang out in Madison County and be normal in Madison County? I'm not sure Madison County would want that um, because you know it's coming from higher incidents to lower incidence areas, and so we'll have to see uh, how all that works. But yeah, technically some areas could reopen before others. Case counts in Charlotte are going to take longer to come down. They had a higher, higher number to begin with, so it'll take longer there. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the state wants to do with that um, and how that works. Um, so just to summarize that, yeah, we're getting close to being re ready to do relaxation. Not quite totally ready yet, um, at least in my opinion. Got to got about a half of a quarter of a basketball game to go. By the way, I caught a lot of heat for that comment last week when I said would Coach K let up in, in the third quarter of a basketball game and, and just slack off and let UNC pull ahead. And I didn't think Coach K would do that. I heard from every UNC fan in the triad. <laughs> they were not happy with that. So, but yeah, you don't, you don't want to relax quite too early. You want to be ready uh, to do it. So, we're getting closer, um, and, um, and some things will be getting back to normal. So every week I give a shout out to some group. Um, I think three weeks ago I gave a shout out to small businesses, take out restaurants, um, and let's patronize these small businesses and take out. Um, and then the next week it was, uh, I think, to, uh, to the citizens in general for doing a good shelter in place and flattening the curve and, and keeping us protected. And then last week, I think it was kids for our children because they've really, um, they've really you know, had to change their lives a lot. Um, and kids are, are social and, uh, and we've really asked a lot of them. This week, the shout outs to our people uh, who are um, in our faith-based areas. Our church leaders, our um, ministers, our pastors, um, rectors, our rabbis, and in those areas of faith. Um, and um, why is that? Because they've really, they've really um, put in, in their, their hard work on this because, the, because of the congregate nature of lots of people coming together in faith areas um, and that not being um, safe to do right now. Um, they've had to really change the way they do things and keep their, their ministries together, keep their organizations and groups together to keep everyone um, uh, in, in a health, healthy way spiritually. They really contribute a lot and they've had to do it under circumstances that they probably never would have imagined that they would have had to do. So this week's shout out is to our people of faith that have been helping us. So with that, um, I think I can open it up for questions. Maybe I missed an area.
Um, are you guys conducting and processing your own cor coronavirus testing here? Yes, yes, we are doing our own testing um, at Wake Forest Baptist Health. Novant's doing their own in-house, and that's really helped us a lot with turnaround time. Um, we, we use commercial kits, but we've also made our own, because you know, we're also a science place and a research place. So we've made our own for backup and for, for research purposes, but our uh, patient testing is on well-vetted, well-studied commercial testing platforms and assays. So our turnaround time's increased by that. We're um, serology, I didn't mention. I've got a lot of questions still, and every week I talk about it, but I'll do it again. What about the blood tests? Do I have antibodies? Have I been exposed? So that's, uh, that's important for n knowledge of, of, um, of how a community may have been affected, how many people have been exposed in a community, and then um, maybe how much herd immunity that you might have in that community, but, uh, and how many people are asymptomatic and have been exposed. So those are sort of epidemiology questions for understanding how the virus travels, and they're also questions for understanding immunity. But a lot of things yet we don't know. So if you test positive, let's say I get tested and I'm positive, what does that mean? Does it mean I'm immune? Well, I don't know. We don't know that yet. We don't know how well a positive test correlates with immunity. We also, uh, we also don't know how long that immunity lasts. So I think some people have heard talk about uh, having a certificate of immunity. So you get a test and you're positive, and, um, it, and then um, you might be able to do things that, you know, because you're, quote, immune. Uh, we're, we're, I don't know about that. Uh, first of all, I don't think we understand immunity that well. Maybe someday in this we will, towards the end of the summer maybe. But the other thing is, is, is that's going to really divide us up a little bit. And, and I'm not sure that's a wise idea from a, from a standpoint of a, for a community and for social things. I mean, like, hey, if you test positive, you, you can get it on an airplane. Sorry, you didn't test positive. You can't go. I mean, it's, it's not how we do things. I think we should find some way to be safe for all of us and not just make it safe for immune people, if immunity exists. So... Um, so that's the serology testing. A lot more questions to answer on that one. What does a full checkmark for testing look like? Yeah, full checkmark. It looks like this. <laughs> Check. Uh, well, I mean, you know, because I, I would like a little bit more capacity um, for it so, <clears throat> um, so that it's more widespread and, and that more places have access to it. For the most part, it's still... You're still going to have to, I mean, the at-home test will be eventually available here, but for the most part, you're going to have to go somewhere, go to one of the, the respiratory clinics or um, to a testing area and be evaluated in testing or go to your doctor's office. So not all of our primary care offices are yet set up and have the, have the, the swabs and the transport media and everything. Um, but as time goes on, that check mark will get more and more solid. You know, I don't know. I, I, a number in mind how many we would need. I would beg off that question and say enough. You know, it depends how many sick people we have and, um, and, and how many we need to do. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, we, and a lot of it's access to it is, you know, more than, than a specific number. So... Um, you know, at some point, maybe sometime in the summertime, there'll be, you know, every doctor's office will be, have the ability to do the test just like we do a strep test or a flu test in the office. Um, but but uh, there's, there's a little bit more work to be done for that testing. And how long have you guys actually been doing the testing here? Oh, uh, in-house. We've been doing in-house testing for a couple weeks now. Um, I think, I mean, yeah, about two and a half weeks. Yeah. Can you kind of pinpoint a reason too as to why there are so many fewer cases uh, in Forsyth than in Guilford County? I know you mentioned that so why is uh, there fewer cases in Forsyth than Guilford County? What, um, 
One is, is that we, we, we may not be testing as much here in Forsyth County uh, as Guilford has. Um, the, the other is, is that um, I, I shelter it in place may have been a little bit more rigorous here. I can't say that 100% for sure because there's no measure of that, but that could be a potential reason. The other is because of these clusters, like I said, if, you know, it, it just so happens by that the clusters, a couple, three clusters have happened in Guilford County and not, um, and not, we haven't had those clusters here yet but we could, and then our numbers would go up too. Whenever you have small numbers, you know, if, if you get 15 or 20 more, it makes it look like a huge jump, when in reality it, it's not. But, um, so, <clears throat> I mean, Davidson County, you know, per population in Davidson County, um, uh, they've, they've had more cases per population than what I would have expected, but, and I don't know 100% why. The other thing about Guilford, obviously, is there's more people there. Um, so you have to look at rates per, to look at a rate means a numerator and a denominator, like a fraction. So how many out of how many? And when you do that between Forsyth and Guilford, it kind of comes together some, yeah. Dr. Rule, how worrisome are these clusters that have popped up? Well, clusters aren't necessarily, you know, worrisome. Um, but they, they need to be addressed and looked at. Um, for a community at large, I don't think the community at large needs to be worried about it. Um, they, just, they just need to be addressed and contained. They make more work for the health departments and for people to figure it out. Some types of clusters, and we've had, we've had some nursing home outbreaks in North Carolina, um, and I, I think almost every region has had one. Uh, except maybe the mountain states. And, and those, those are worse than from the standpoint is there are a lot of vulnerable hosts in a nursing home. So um, we, we, uh, those have to be addressed and, and gotten after very quickly. And nursing homes, if, if you have a loved one in a nursing home, I think you know, um, are, are really on a state of lockdown. I mean, they're measuring and, and screening all their employees and anyone walking in and visitations usually not allowed and we uh, we we screen people going into nursing homes now um, by either quarantining them for 14 days or testing them or doing both so um, we don't we do not like COVID-19 in a nursing home bad combination Yeah, the question is, should, biz, should businesses and, and such be more lenient in the future um, in, in allowing people to quarantine and isolate? Yes. Uh, sick people should not be coming to work. Uh, contacts of people who are known to have COVID, have tested positive, uh, should not be coming to work. Um, as time goes on, I hope that anyone who gets a respiratory illness will get tested for COVID-19 so we can so the contacts know who they are. Um, and um, um, they should be more lenient. I, also, I didn't mention earlier, where on the relaxations that such would larger businesses go, you know, like corporations, so, um, you know, places that have more than 500 employees. So uh, most of these places have been doing their own sort of get back to, to, to work routine, to planning. And when then they're given the, the, the green light, most of these places will be screening their um, employees and visitors and contractors coming in with uh, questions and, and some with temperature checks as well. Um, and then they'll be asking for masking in, the, in, the, uh, in their workplaces um, as long as they're not in their office or cubicle, I think. I mean, every, every company's a little different, but um, and then uh, they may be bringing their people back in stages. <clears throat> so, you know, for stage one, if, if, you, if you take relaxation in three stages, one, two, and three, for stage one, perhaps they'll only bring back half of their people and the other half will stay working at home. Stage two, they'll start to bring in more of the project 
people who you know have important projects to get going and going on, and then three bring everyone back, <clears throat> and that helps you know cut down on commuting and needs for lunches and you know so um, so that uh, so that's so large businesses I think they're, they're, they've all been planning on this at least the ones I know have been. Um, Other questions? Um, back to the in-house testing, uh, what did it take to get it uh, set up, and how has it helped the healthcare system? So in-house testing, what does it take to get it set up? Well, you need, um, you need a laboratory. <laughs> it sounds kind of obvious, but um, so in, when you're testing, um, you have to do it in, in, so the FDA has three different kind of ways that tests can be when you do a test, and you have to have hoods and places to work with the tests, <clears throat> and then you have to have the ability, you have to have trained people to do it. So most hospitals have a microbiology laboratory, so testing has been incorporated into that laboratory. Um, and then, um, so you have to get the materials, um, and which are the chemicals that we use to do the test. So the main tests we use for COVID are, are tests looking for the, for the nuclear material, the RNA, that so-called fingerprint, RNA fingerprint, like you see in, you know, using in, on TV detective shows. It's not too different than that. And so you need chemicals to work that up, and then you need uh, to have enough swabs so that you can put, put it in a person's nose and get way back in there. Um, and then you have to have a, a, a transport vehicle to put that swab into to actually get it to the lab where the test is done. So all that stuff has to come together. So, um, and any shortage of anything in that sequence um, can really get in your way of having enough tests. If you don't have enough swabs, um, it, then if the swabs are special. You can't just use a Q-tip. Would would get in the way of that. A shortage of one chemical out of the five or six you use would be enough to shut you down. So you have to make sure you have all that supply chain. And then after you do that, you have to make sure the test is working like it's supposed to. Um, and we call that validation. And then once you've done that, then you can get start collecting patient samples and doing it. So it's a process. It, it takes a little while. And how has that helped your health? Oh, how's it helped our healthcare system? Oh boy, a lot. First of all, um, we can do a lot more than if we're mailing them out to a commercial lab down the road, and the turnaround time's a lot better. So we can we can respond to our own needs a lot quicker, um, and it just increases the number for a community um, and for a healthcare system to be doing it. So um, so capacity and turnaround time are the biggies, and also reporting because we can get it real quick into our own electronic medical records. What is the testing capacity here? What is the turnaround time? Oh, a turnaround time depends. So we have three different kinds of tests we can use, and it depends which one um, is used. And we use them specifically for different areas. So it's uh, anywhere from three hours to 24 hours. For most areas and outpatient areas, 24 hours is enough. I mean, you don't have to know within minutes. Um, if somebody's going home to isolate and they've been tested, 24 hours is fine. So in, cer in certain other areas, you know, emergencies, emergency rooms, and things, you want the faster turnaround. So, um, but it used to be three to eight days. So big improvement. There was something else I was going to say. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you. See you next week.